This video is sponsored by Normandy 1998. Pika, use thunder. These words briefly fill Slowpoke well, though this is not an issue for long, as all who are enraged to hear it are promptly knocked out by the sheer amount of electricity that goes coursing through their body a moment later, and it is only when he is sure that the Team Rocket grunts are unconscious that Red drops down into the cavern with Pika by his side. Three months have passed since their departure from the Oak Corral, and during that time, Red along with his Pokemon have been working tirelessly to disrupt any Team Rocket activity they have come across. Having received a tip off that Team Rocket were cutting off and selling Slowpoke tails, Red had made a beeline for Azalea Town, and now as he looks around at the unconscious bodies dressed in black, he knows that he was right to do so. Heading deeper in, Red quickly runs into another contingent of grunts, though Pika has no problem taking care of them, just like the ones guarding the entrance, leaving their path to the well's centre free and clear. Here they come across the Rocket Leader, and it is someone they know well, the former future Gym Leader and member of the Team Rocket Command Triad, Koga. Upon seeing who the intruder is, the corners of Koga's mouth twist in a faint smirk, with him commenting that he'd been wondering how long it would take him to cross paths with the absentee champ. Red retorts that it's a bit rich for the ninja to call him that considering how he and Sabrina abandoned their posts, though he has to admit he'd been hoping to run into Koga as well, since he might be able to shed some light on something Surge told him about there being a top secret base here in Johto that only Giovanni's inner circle knows about, though from the looks of things maybe the poison specialist fallen out of favour with the boss, since why else would he assign him to debase himself mutilating defenseless? A slowpoke. Being smart enough to recognize an attempt to make him angry so he'll let something slip, the calm and collected Koga merely replies that to follow his master's orders, no matter what he may personally feel as the duty of a shinobi, something a hot-headed renegade like Red would know nothing about. Bristling, Red warns Koga that this is his last chance to tell him where Giovanni is, otherwise it'll mean a battle. Though with a stoic nod, the ex gym leader states that a battle was inevitable the moment Red entered this place. He then brings out his crowbat, while Red tells Pika to do his thing, with the electric red and letting loose the thunder that illuminates the entire cave. Being weak to electric moves, this does massive damage to Crobat, though when Koga orders it to get back in the fight, it exhibits the same tenacity as its trainer, rising back into the air and coming in for a wing attack. However, once again, Pika proves himself Crobat's superior, catching the blow with an iron tail and pushing it back, which in turn leaves the bat wide open for a second thunder. With a cocky smirk, Red tells his opponent that this butt kicking can end any time Koga wants, he just has to tell him where to find Giovanni. But with a scowl, Koga ardently refuses, stating that he will not surrender his honor. Instead, he will retreat for now, though they will meet again once he has completed training rigorous enough to put him on par with the young champion. He then recalls Crobat and vanishes in a puff of smoke, leaving Red to kick the ground and hiss that they were so close. From a small distance away, a male voice says that he knows the feeling, and whipping his head round, Red sees a slowpoke wandering towards him. Having seen some weird stuff in his time, Red does not scream, though his disconcertion must be obvious on his face, as with a chuckle, the talking slowpoke adds that maybe this will make the boy feel more comfortable, before standing on his hind legs, to reveal that he is actually a man in a brilliant slowpoke disguise. Sticking out a hand to shake, the stranger then introduces himself as Agent Handsome of the International Police, explaining that he spent the last week deep undercover here to catch Team Rocket in the act of slowpoke tail smuggling, though unfortunately it seems their leader got away. In a tone that suggests he doesn't really care about Handsome, business, Red half-heartedly apologizes, saying he'll get out of the man's hair then, since he's got to go track down Koga. Though with a good-natured smile, Handsome replies that there's no need to part ways, as it would appear their goals are one and the same. He then reveals that he is part of a task force, devoted to finishing what Red started in Kanto and snuffing out Team Rocket before they can renew their reign of terror here in Johto, a task that would be much easier if they had the help of the young man who started it all. For a moment, Red weighs his options, playing them out like battles in his head. As far as he can tell, there's no downside to this proposed arrangement since having the resource of an Interpol task force will likely help him find Giovanni far sooner than he could have on his own. Having made up his mind, Red tells Handsome that he's in, though he has one condition. When they find Giovanni, he's his and his alone. Something the detective agrees to without hesitation, causing Red to reach out and clasp his hand at last, sealing their pack. Returning to the present, we find Ash, sprawled out on his back, with Pikachu by his side. After a time he stirs, first blinking sleep from his eyes, then shaking off the metaphorical cobwebs as he rises to a sitting position. Looking around, he does not recognize this place, which resembles a large martial arts dojo, having thick wooden floors and walls which look as though they've withstood their fair share of powerful moves. It is only now that Ash remembers the events that led to his unconsciousness, with him casting his eyes around frantically as he calls for AJ, though, to his dismay, it seems that he and Pikachu Sure alone. 
At least, that is what Ash thinks, right up until the voice of the purple-haired woman fills his ears. Somehow, it sounds as though her words are coming from every direction, stopping Ash from pinpointing a location, though this is hardly his biggest concern, as thanks to the remnants of sleep powder in his system, he has to concentrate more intently to fully comprehend what is being said. In that hateful voice, the woman sneers that his friend is fine, still probably passed out under that tree where she left him, before adding that he really ought to be more concerned about himself, since he is in the ninja mansion and entirely at her mercy. Scowling fiercely, Ash demands that his captor show herself and tell him what she wants with him, though with a mocking chuckle, she retorts that she is not so foolish as to give up her main advantage, though she supposes he does deserve to know the name of his killer. She is Janine. Ninja Mistress of the Future Gym. Still a little befuddled, Ash asks what she's talking about saying she's his killer, to which Janine responds that his master took someone very precious from her, so now she's just returning the favour, an eye for an eye so to speak. She then barks him to bring out his Pokemon, since there's no honour in killing a defenceless foe, though Ash angrily refuses, declaring that he won't play her sick game. Scowl coming through in her voice now, Janine snaps that he doesn't have a choice, since she gave him a chance to save himself, so if he will not fight, then her conscience will not trouble her for doing him in. At these words, a hatch opens in the ceiling, with a large Arios dropping down to land on Ash and pin him to the floor. Fangs dripping with venom, it prepares to pierce his throat on Janine's command, though thankfully, Pikachu is there to help his partner out, slamming headfirst into Ariados with quick attack and sending the long legged Pokemon skidding away. Scrambling desperately to his feet, Ash takes off at a sprint with Pikachu by his side, their eyes peeled for any sign of an exit. Unfortunately, all they see are corridors which lead into more corridors, each of which seem entirely uniform, as if designed to disorientate anyone other than the resident. Though, this is not their only concern, as behind them they hear the scuttling of many feet, which can only mean that Ariados is back on their tail. Knowing they can't outrun something like that, Ash changes tack, looking for somewhere they can take a stand, as he has every confidence that in a fair fight, Pikachu could beat the bug. The only problem is, nothing about this place is fair. This fact is only proven truer a moment later, when a panel of what Ash thought was solid wall drops away to reveal a hidden alcove where Janine and her Venomoth have been lying in wait. Springing into action, the deadly duo set about their work, with Janine putting herself between Ash and Pikachu, while Venomoth lifts the electric red into the air with its telekinetic powers and tosses him back down the corridor, just as Ariados rounds the corner. Together, the pair of poison types then begin harassing Pikachu, who cannot handle being attacked from two sides at once. All the while, Ash frantically tries to get to his best friend, crying out his name and encouraging him to stay strong. Unfortunately, Janine is too great of an obstacle to overcome, using her athletic prowess to always position herself in a way that Ash cannot pass through, and so accepting that he cannot help Pikachu, the young son of Pallet does the next best thing, grabbing a ball and lobbing it into the fray. In a flash of light, Frogadier bursts forth, and seeing Ariados and Venomoth ganging up on Pikachu, springs into action with a double water pulse, driving the duo back. It then lands beside its friend, and after checking that the little electric type is alright, takes a combat stance. Seething at this turnabout, Janine tells Venomoth to use Psychic on the frog, and toss it aside so that it can get to Pikachu, the ire in her voice rising when she says the name of Ash's starter. Dutifully, Venomoth attempts to lift Frogadier out of the way, The wanting to repay his friend for the earlier assist, Pikachu uses this moment to strike the poison moth with a thunderbolt, which breaks its concentration and saves the middle stage water type. Landing with the ninja's grace once again, Frogadier expresses his appreciation with a thumbs up, a gesture which Pikachu readily returns, making it clear to see that they will fight as a team and watch each other's backs. To demonstrate this, the pair then launch a combined water pulse thunderbolt on Ash's command, the orb of electrified water storing a direct hit on Venomoth and making it skitter in pain. However, this is not where the onslaught ends, as in a further show of synchronicity when Pikachu leaps into Frogadier's arms, the Bubble Frog Pokemon uses Pound to launch him into the air, just as he himself uses Quick Attack, doubling the speed momentum of the move, so that when Pikachu hits Venomoth, it is with the force of a living torpedo. Falling out of the sky together, both Pikachu and Venomoth strike the hard wooden floor, though while Pikachu looks exhilarated from the success of the Fastball special, Venomoth looks about ready to pass out. Grinning, Ash declares that Janine's Pokemon is beaten, though with a sneer, the ninja retorts that Venomoth may be down, but what of Ariados? It is only now that Ash realises in the midst of his attack on Venomoth, he entirely lost sight of Ariados, though it seems the same cannot be said for the Arachnid, as bursting from another hatch in the ceiling, it sprays sticky webs into Ash's face. Letting out a gasp of shock, the boy staggers backwards, though as he is about to learn, this is a dreadfully poor idea, as in his blinded state, he unwittingly stumbles onto a trap door, which opens up beneath him, sending him tumbling out of the gym and into the open air, where a long lethal drop into a ravine awaits him.
Six months have passed since Red's meeting with Agent Handsome, and during that time, he has worked closely with the task force, using their resources and access to classified information regarding Giovanni's dealings both public and private to track down and apprehend any Team Rocket scum who dare make a move in Johto. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, they have been unable to capture any major players in the criminal syndicate, though that is all going to change tonight, as they have received word of a brazen Team Rocket operation going on right in the heart of Goldenrod City. According to their source, Team Rocket agents have seized control of the radio tower and intend to use it for some unknown sinister purpose. Though truthfully, Red is far more interested in the nature of this operation. It reminds him of the Sylph takeover from his first journey, and if it's anywhere near as important to Team Rocket's objectives, then Giovanni himself will have to be here to oversee it. Like the Sylph raid, Red will not be undertaking this mission alone, though instead of blue and green, he will be working with Lance the Dragon Master, who is the Pokemon G-Men's representative on the task force. Currently, the pair of them, along with Handsome, Lieutenant Surge, and a small group of Interpol agents, are aboard the SS Aqua, more just outside Goldenrod Harbor. Thanks to Surge's nautical knowledge, they are nice and hidden by the evening mists off the sea, meaning they can see the glowing lights of their target, but no one looking out over the water can see them. Perfect for a sneak attack. And this is exactly what Red and Lance have been assigned to do, as due to being the strongest battlers on the task force, they will be going in first and trying to draw out any senior rocket officers, while also deactivating any security measures Team Rocket have set in place, so Handsome can lead the group of Interpol officers and their Pokemon in storming the lower levels and cutting off any escape route. Understanding their roles, the two young battlers then take off on Arrow and Dragonite, flying straight up, then approaching the radio tower from above, in order to give their enemies as little forewarning as possible. When they get close, Lance calls out to Red over the whipping wind, asking if he's got a plan to get in, and with a nod, the young champ tosses a Pokeball into the air, bringing out his Snorlax, Snore. Due to being high up, Snore immediately begins to fall, though this is all part of the plan, as Red tells it to use strength to bust through the roof and create an opening for them. Bellowing its understanding, Snore does exactly that, punching a hole clean through the top of the radio tower and beginning the raid with a bang. At the sight of this wanton destruction, Lance scowls, chastising Red for his recklessness, since people could have been hurt or worse by the ceiling collapse. Though with a scowl of his own, Red retorts that they're not people, they're Team Rocket, telling Lance to get that through his head as he brings Arrow in for a dive. Following on Dragonite, Lance soon touches down beside his partner, and wanting to do their part as efficiently as possible, suggests they split up to complete both objectives at the same time. Nodding, Red says he'll go seek out the leader of this operation, leaving Lance to disable security, so Handsome and his people can storm the lower levels. And seeing no problem with this, Lance agrees, wishing the young man luck. When he is alone, Red brings out all his Pokemon, and seeing no need to restrain himself against Team Rocket, orders them to cut loose. What follows can only be called devastation, as Red's six companions show off the full extent of their might, with water, lightning, leaves, rocks, and hyper beams tearing through the building. Those who see it coming have no choice but to flee in terror, while those that do not suffer dearly for their lack of observation, their pained cries blending in with the wailing of the radio tower's alarms. Red has no pity for any of them, as they made their choice when they joined up with Giovanni, and so makes no attempt to help them as he descends lower into the tower. Soon he comes across the person he can only assume is the leader, a man with a houndoom, though even it is no match for a single hit from Polly, while Red has saw grab the rocket leader in its vines and lift him off the ground. He then tells the grass star to use solar beam, and despite it being night time, Saw's power is enough to draw in the sunlight reflected off the moon as it charges up a beam of white energy. Coldly, Red tells the rocket that luckily for them this will take a moment to charge, so he's got a chance to tell him where Giovanni is, otherwise he's about to get a full body suntan from which he'll never recover. Frantically, the rocket leader cries that he doesn't know, and that he's just a mid-level nobody who's never even met the boss in person, though clearly Red is not moved. Hatred in his eyes as he tells Saw to fire. Rumbling its understanding, Saw launches the solar beam, and at such close range it is practically assured to strike true. That is until a hyper beam from behind sends it off course, with both beams shattering a window and causing Night Air to rush in. Turning around, Red sees Lance and Dragon Dragonite, the latter of whom is recharging from its last attack. Furiously, Red demands Lance explain himself. Though equally riled up, Lance retorts that he should be asking that, snapping that Red's methods are way over the line. Barely contained rage in his voice, Red spits back that Lance is a coward just like all the rest, wanting him to not get in his way again. Though before he can return to his interrogation, a shadow falls over the room, and as Red turns back to the whole Soren Dragonite maid, he sees Koga, while behind him floats his Crobat, looking more powerful than ever. Recognizing the danger the command triad Shinobi poses, Red and Lance wordlessly agree to bury the hatchet for the time being, with Lance having Dragonite fly at Crobat and attempt a Dragon Claw. However, to the shock of everyone, Crobat is faster, with it demonstrating the fruits of its 
promised training by vanishing from view, only to appear above the dragon type a moment later and strike it from above, sending it hurtling dozens of stories down towards the ground. Worried for his partner's safety, Lance barges past Red to look out the hole, though Koga hardly seems to mind, as he and Crobat advance further into the room, ready at last to have their rematch. Figuring it's only fitting to match Koga, Red tells everyone but Pika to stand back, with the electric red and flashing his cheeks as he snarls at the bat he so easily beat before. Unfortunately, this fight is not so easy, with it being clear that Crobat and Koga have learned some new tricks since last they met. Chief amongst these is Screech, as by lowering Pika's defense early on, Crobat is able to fight on a more even footing with the electric type, even overcoming Iron Tail when it and Wing Attack clash this time. Were this a normal battle, Red would compliment Koga, as by his assessment the man is almost champion level, though, as he intends to show, almost is never good enough when it comes to him. He therefore has Pika use a massive thunder attack, which blows out all the other windows, as well as destroying any machinery still left intact up to this point. As he knew it would, this does colossal damage to Crobat, though like before, it withstands the blow, causing Koga to call for a toxic. At once, a purple rash forms beneath Pika's eyes, though refusing to go down like this, Red tells his friend to use Vault Tackle. Like with the other three times, Pika's body glows with crackling electricity, and when he slams into Crobat there is no contest, with the bat falling from the sky utterly decimated. However, However, before Red can demand Koga surrender and give up his boss's location, a second burst of lightning fills the room, this time having erupted involuntarily from Pika. Rushing to his side, Red urges him to be strong, though sadly this self-inflicted damage is too much for the rodent, as he writhes and screams while discharging randomly. Assuming this must be a side effect of Koga's poison messing with Pika's body, Red recalls him into his ball so that he may rest, though in the time it's taken to do so, the ninja has gathered up his crowbat in the mid-level rocket and fled once more into the night. Seething, Red looks to Lance, demanding to know why he didn't stop the extreme leader from escaping. Though with a scowl, the dragon tamer retorts that there was nothing he could do to stop Koga, considering how easily he dispatched his strongest Pokemon. Evidently, Red does not find this to be a satisfactory answer, already readying another dig at the redhead. Though, before he can unleash it, Lance cuts him off, saying that he wasn't finished speaking. While he couldn't stop Koga, he was able to place a tracker on his Crobat, while Red had everyone's attention with that giant thunder attack. So now all they have to do is follow it, since in the beaten state he's in, Koga's almost certain to lead them directly to the main team rocket base. Though he is still angry with Lance for interfering, Red cannot deny that he did well, and so gives him a curt nod before telling him to lead the way. However, Lance refuses on two counts. First, they have to complete their mission here, and second, neither Dragonite nor Pika are in any state to break into Team Rocket's primary hideout. As he makes the second point, he pulls something from his belt and tosses it to Red, with the other boy finding it to be a small glass vial filled with clear liquid. Pulling out another and tipping it onto the now returned Dragonite, Lance explains that it's water from the healing spring on top of Mount Silver with Red being surprised to see that in an instant, Dragonite's injury from its brief battle with Crobat has healed over good as new. Hoping it'll have the same effect on Pika, Red brings forth the mouse once again, finding him still in that volatile and clearly painful state. In a low voice, he urges his friend to hang on just a little while longer, promising that he'll make him all better. Then, with slightly shaking hands, he pours the water over Pika's head. Like with Dragonite, the recovery is instantaneous, and as the little electric type's eyes flicker open, Red pulls him into a hug. Even Lance cannot help but be touched by this, and so in a slightly soft a voice tells Red to come on, since they need to meet up with Handsome's team. Nodding, Red follows after the dragon trainer, Pika now firmly on his shoulder, though as they go to leave the room, the young champ looks out through the hole into the night sky one last time. Soon they will know where the secret rocket base is, and when they do, Red will finally be able to settle the score with both Koga and Giovanni. Thwop! This is the sound that fills Ash's ears as he lands hard on something solid and sticky, only a few seconds after falling through the trap door. Looking down, he sees that he is on some sort of vast Ariados web situated under the gym, likely having been constructed to stop unwary challengers from falling to their deaths. Hearing the distressed cries of Pikachu and Frogadier up above, he calls out to assure them that he's okay, with a pair quickly leaping down to join him. When they're all back together, Ash tells his friends to help him find a way off the web that doesn't involve jumping into the ravine, since now that they're out of that crazy building, they can finally make their escape. Unfortunately, it seems Janine has other ideas, as in a venomous tone, she tells the boy not to be so hasty, descending slowly on Ariados's back, before declaring that their battle is still taking place. Getting a little fed up with this whole routine now, Ash tells Janine to quit it, saying he's done. Though with a scowl, the ninja retorts there's only one way in which their battle will be done, when one of them goes plunging into the watery depths below. She then orders Ariados and Venomoth to attack with no mercy, and seeing that he truly has no choice but to fight, Ash reluctantly tells Pikachu and Frogadier to meet their opponent's head on, though even as he does so, he is already thinking of non-lethal ways to end this match. Clashing once more in the middle of the webby field, Pikachu and Frogadier both find themselves at a disadvantage, as the speed on which they so frequently rely has been severely reduced thanks to the sticky nature of the flooring. 
In contrast, Ariados and Venomoth seem quite fine, as Ariados is used to traversing its own webs, while Venomoth as a flyer has no need to touch them at all. This allows the pair of poison bugs to land a couple of easy hits, with Pikachu taking a poison jab to the gut from Ariados, while Frogadi has its vitality set by a super effective Giga Drain courtesy of Venomoth. Recognizing that this makes Venomoth the greater threat, Ash has both Pikachu and Frogadier targeted with another fastball special, though out here in the open air, it has far more space to dodge, evading the attack, then coming back to assail them both with a bug buzz. Even Ash has to clutch his ears in the face of such an unnerving sound, which unfortunately leaves him and his team vulnerable to Janine's follow-up attack, an electro web from Ariados, which pins Frogadier in place, allowing her team to focus the entirety of their wrath on Pikachu, just like she wants, evidently having a special hatred for the electric rodent. Together, the pair then begin to wail on the mouse worse than they did inside the ninja mansion, as when Pikachu is knocked onto his back, he quickly finds his fur being caught in the webs, trapping him in place and leaving his soft belly exposed. Desperately, Ash tells his starter to use Thunderbolt to drive the two assailants off, though as he soon will learn, Ariados webs are excellent conductors of electricity, with both Frogadier and himself taking a hit along with Ariados. Sneering cruelly, Janine asks if Ash realizes how hopeless his position is now, and for a moment, Ash can't help but waver as he sees his two friends pinned down and about to suffer even further. However, before he can speak, a new voice enters the conversation, one Ash knows well, as he encouragingly states that he thought he taught Ash better than to give up. Turning his gaze skyward, Ash sees Red along with AJ watching through one of the gym's windows, and as mentor and student's eyes meet, Red flashes Ash a smile that says in no uncertain terms he believes in him. Unfortunately, this joyous reunion is cut short when Janine speaks up, during that she's so glad her little bait worked, as she coldly welcomes Red to her gym. When Red sees the young woman, a shadow falls over his eyes, and all joviality fades away, with him opening his mouth to apologize. However, Janine evidently doesn't want to hear it, cutting him off with a hiss, as she declares that she's going to take his protege away from him, just like he took her father. That is unless he's still the same ruthless killer he was back in Mahogany Town. Sighing deeply, Red refuses her ultimatum, stating that he's not that person anymore, and that he's trying to be better. Then, to the surprise of the boys, he offers her a hand, saying that if she'll let him, he'd like to help her be better too. He knows what it's like to live for nothing but vengeance, and he knows where that road leads. So please, as a way to make amends for what he did to her family, let him help her find another way. For a moment, there is silence. Then, as if watching a sunset in real time, Janine's face darkens as she tells him to shut up. She doesn't need his trite platitudes. There is only one way, the ninja way, blood for blood. Sighing once again, Red replies that he's sorry she feels that way, the warns she will not get a pound of flesh here, as he knows Ash is more than strong enough to win this fight. He just needs to keep his focus. These words of encouragement act like a stimulant to the boy, with him feeling as though he can now do anything in that moment, and as he surveys the battlefield now with new eyes free of fear, he realizes just what he has to do to win. Looking first to Frogadier, he tells it to use Pound on the web floor beneath it, as while it cannot go through the Electro web without being badly hurt, the same is not true of the regular kind it is lying on. As planned, this Pound punches a hole clean through the webbing, allowing the water type to climb out, then, using both the stickiness of the substance and its own natural adhesive, run upside down along the underside of the hanging battlefield, before popping back up right under Ariados and knocking it away from Pikachu. This at last gives the Electric Rodent enough legroom to perform a backwards quick attack, kicking off the web and finally tearing himself free. Now back in the battle, the pair of Pokemon perform another electrified water pulse, with Pikachu leaping into the air this time, so his electricity does not hurt Ash or Frogadier. Like the first one, this does massive damage to Venomoth, and as its wet wings give out on it, it crashes to the webs, unconscious. This just leaves Ariados, though it is plain to see that Janine's fearsome ace will not go down without a fight, skittering forward and attempting to strike both of Ash's Pokemon with a poison jab. Thankfully, Pikachu and Frogadier have plenty of fight left in them too, with the Ninja Frog using Double Team to distract its foe, while Pikachu falls back when Ash tells him to wait for something. That something is revealed a moment later, when Ariados strikes the first Frogadier, only to find that it is an afterimage, though this is not just any afterimage, but an afterimage covering a mound of thick sticky frubbles. Now it is Ariados' turn to be stuck, as his natural ability to traverse its own webs does not apply to the Colossian goo, with Frogadier using this chance to bombard the long legged Pokemon with more frubbles, this time aimed at each of its feet. Then, when each of the arachnid's legs are firmly encased, Pikachu at last springs into action, leaping into the air and firing off a thunder bolt directly down at Ariados. For a moment, Ash braces himself for another shock just in case the plan failed, though to his delight, it never comes, while across from him, Janine realizes the Frubbles are acting as a sort of insulation, keeping all the electricity bound to Ariados' body for bonus damage. 
This is too much for the poison bug type, who lets out an excruciated wail while trying to break free, though when this proves impossible, it does the only thing it can, keel over with spirals for eyes. Rushing over to his friends, Ash pulls them both into a hug, while from the window, AJ cheers that he knew Ash would be able to beat that purple-haired nutjob, while Red gives his student a proud nod. As for Janine, she simply scowls, recalling her Pokemon and tossing Ash a small pink badge. Looking confused, Ash asks what this is for, to which the ninja answers that he bested her, and by rights, that entitles him to her badge, though he should not take this as any sort of sign that she has forgiven him or his master, merely that she will not besmirch the legacy of her father by acting with dishonor. She then declares that they will meet again after the rain, before vanishing in a puff of smoke, leaving Ash and his Pokemon to find their own way back up to the gym. Thanks to some help from Corviknight, the trio are able to manage without too much trouble, and as Ash begins dusting the remnants of Ariados webs from his pants, Red approaches to ask if he's okay. Nodding, Ash replies that he's fine, though there's something he needs to ask his mentor. Janine said that Red took away someone precious from her, that he killed her father. That's not true, is it? There is no hesitation to Red's answer, nor does he attempt to look away from Ash. Instead, he meets the boy's eyes, and in a tone laced with gravity and regret, replies that he did kill Koga. And that's where we'll leave things. Why did Red take Koga's life in their final confrontation? How will Ash handle this revelation from his hero? And what did Janine mean about meeting again after the rain? Find out as the journey continues.